Why don't we go ahead and start the meeting tonight? My name is Diana Winand, and I am the chapter chair of the San Fernando Valley Climate Reality Chapter. And um, we have a great program for you tonight. Um, we have two folks from LA Sanitation. And before we hear from them, we're going to take care of a few things that we like to do, sort of warm things up, catch up. And um, one of the things we love to start our meetings with is a land acknowledgement. Uh, so I want to pitch it uh, to uh, Christy Pace, who is our Partners and Engagement Coordinator. Christy, would you do the land acknowledgement for us tonight? So as we start the meeting today, um, I'll just invite you to put your feet on the ground, connect yourself to the earth, um, your seat in your chair, and um, if you'd like to close your eyes, I would definitely invite that. <laughs> And um, we just want to, as we begin the meeting today, acknowledge this land that we stand on. Um, we, are do, we do land acknowledgements in order to honor the First Nations of this land. In this case, the Tongva, Tataviam, Chumash, and Kitsch people who have been stewarding this land for thousands of years and are our neighbors today. We also like to acknowledge our neighbors, the oak trees and the lizards and all the creepy crawlies and flighted relatives in the area who have also been taking care of the earth for time immemorial. <laughs> immemorial. And as we consider that today, we ask each of you to reflect upon the colonizing systems that still exist in our world and any part you may play in them or of either supporting them or not acting against them and with this land acknowledgement we invite you to learn unlearn and decolonize your thoughts and actions throughout your day and to consider learning from and engaging with the First Nations that are here with us today and very much alive and well in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. We really appreciate that. So I'm going to turn it over to Kathy, who's going to introduce our guest for the evening. Kathy? Thank you, Diana. We are really happy to have these two awesome people who will give us a ton of information tonight. Um, Alex Helu is has been with the City of Los Angeles for with for more than 20 years. He's a chemical engineer with a master's degree in environmental engineering. He heads the Solid Resources Group that's responsible for managing solid waste for the entire city of Los Angeles, including collection, transport, and processing of source separated recyclables, green materials, and municipal solid waste from 750,000 residential customers. He's in charge of implementing many of the key solid waste management strategies to help the city of Los Angeles and LA Sanitation achieve zero waste by 2025. Jennifer Pinkerton is an assistant division manager of the solid resources. This is, these are tongue twisters. The solid resources <laughs> citywide recycling division of LA Sanitation and Environment. She joined LA Sanitation in 2014 and manages several programs, including city facility, facilities recycling, environmentally preferable purchasing, and zero waste. She began her pro environmental career as an analyst with the United Nations Environment Program, focusing on the impacts of tourism and petroleum in the Mediterranean. She's worked for the city of Los Angeles on climate change, air quality, and solar and green power. She has a master of international management, um, SWANA, and you're wondering what SWANA is. Um, and it, she has a master of international management, period, and SWANA, Solid Waste Association of North American Certification <laughs> for Manager of Zero Waste. So thank you both for being here. We will um, have a few questions, just a few right at the end. No, a lot of <laughs> questions. We're, we're all very interested in your topic. So um, like Christy said, we're gonna turn the chat off until the end of your presentation so we don't get distracted. Thank you. Yeah. Alex, would you like to add a few comments at the beginning or? 
Well, I just want to thank you again, Diana and Kathy, uh, to be here tonight. I saw so many faces that I remember from last <laughs> year. So it's really great to see you and being engaged um, with us. And it's always refreshing when we get support for the project for the reports when we submit them to council. Um, 2020 was a very hard year for us in sanitation. We were just trying to survive. Last year, luckily, with the support of council, we were able to push our plastic report. And this coming year, we'll be pushing the organics. Coming up on February the 3rd, we'll go into committee. And we can give you also a glimpse of what we're doing on that front. So I really appreciate being here today. And I want to turn it over to Jennifer so she can give you the presentation. And we're here to answer any questions. And if you like me, sometimes the great questions comes after. We'll be glad to answer those questions later on, too. Thank you. OK, thank you again. I'll just go ahead and share the screen now. Um, it's a rather text dense presentation, so I won't go over every single point. We're happy to share the PowerPoint with you. Um, but just want to give you kind of a overview of what we're working on. So let me try this, share screen. Um, is that working? Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Okay. So I do want to say, let me go back first. It was a real privilege to work on this project. It's not that often that really comprehensive policy opportunities come along. Um, we don't generate policy at sanitation. The council generates policies, but then they say to us, for example, how do we achieve zero waste? And the department puts together a zero waste plan, or how do we comply with SB 1383? And then we put together a plan showing them how we think that should be done. So this was a circumstance where we had many, several motions that had come out of the council dealing with different elements of plastic pollution and got to work on one report encompassing all of them. So as you're probably aware, we've already done some work on plastics pollution. We've got the straws on request policy, and then we adopted the foodware accessories on request policy this year. But we were told this time, be bold, be aggressive, don't be hemmed in by the exact language that's in the council motions for which you're writing reports. So I took that literally and I just pretty much played God. I said, here's what I would do if I were in charge for a couple of weeks and I could eliminate things. I could say, I could implement bans. I could implement fees. So I just really was very aggressive with this, not, not saying that all of these will be put into place, but I just took a look at what I thought was the general landscape out there and how I would change it. So these were the eight council motions. As you can see, they're on a variety of topics. We had to incorporate these into our report. A big one there probably jumps out polystyrene or expanded polystyrene. I'm sure you're all aware that more than 100 California cities have implemented bans of some sort, but it also addresses bottled water, leash lids, um, life cycle analysis of our current trash hauling system, and all sorts of things. So the report encompassed all that, but again, I went beyond that. So how I approached this, I looked at different categories for organizing the report. I looked at highly littered items. I looked at the category of corporate responsibility. I looked at single use disposable items. So as you see, as we go through, I group things in those different categories. But the most important thing to me is that as a city, San or as a department, sanitation is responsible for managing, when you think about it, everything that is thrown its way, everything that we buy and then toss into either a blue bin or black bin or a green bin. But it's rather absurd that sanitation can't exert some control over the materials being thrown its way. I just always thought that, that how are we supposed to cope with every type of new packaging that comes out there? So this is about exerting what I'm calling a new type of flow control, meaning we should start looking upstream and regulating materials that are introduced into the city and into the marketplace, since it is the city and you as ratepayers that have to pay for managing all those materials. It's about making manufacturers and retailers bear more of the responsibility for the products that they put out there into the marketplace. So this is one of our major groupings. It's basically lead by example. So each city department has to develop a plan for how they will achieve zero waste in their facilities, which requires them to look at all aspects of their operations. 
um, and that we also want all of our events to be zero waste. You know, pre-COVID, of course, we had hundreds of community events every year that are on city property, city permitted them. So I think we ought to be able to control that. We as a city should exert more control over what types of food we allow to be sold, how food is packaged, what types of products can be sold or offered at, at events. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, that is our first step is walking the talk. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, polystyrene, we are way behind the curveball on this. So two phases to this, most likely banning EPS foodware, and then a second phase will be banning other types of EPS products. And the second bullet point, this is what San Francisco does. Unless your product is encased in a more durable material, if it's EPS, it's banned. So this is one of the major categories. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as you know, we the city phased out single-use plastic bags, the very flimsy bags that basically tore after one use, but we allowed heavier reusable bags. But we're finding that too many of those are often treated as though they are single-use bags. I just said ban all plastic bags, period. There were not always pro plastic produce bags out in the world. We survived without them. We can survive without them again. There's really no reason why a clothing store should be able to give you a plastic bag and a grocery store can't. Um, so I'm just saying ban all plastic bags. Um, and also single-use plastic cups. There are alternatives. Serve beverages in their original containers or provide aluminum cups or, God forbid, reusable cups, right? So I'm trying to look at highly littered items. The next area, bottled beverages. This, this encompasses a lot of things. Um, looked at water. Really don't see a need for water to be sold in plastic bottles. There are water fountains. The city is purchasing more uh, water trucks. Hydration stations can be installed with water fountains. Um, LAX, you may have read, banned the sale of bottled water a few months ago. Um, so it can be done. This is, it's trending now. Um, this is also a bit of a catch, catch all category, but I'm, we're also seeing, we have a problem with markets for all the plastic materials that we capture in our blue bins. Basically 90% of all plastic that's out there is recycled and everything else is disposed. So I think we need to help foment, develop better domestic markets for plastics. And so that's one reason I'm suggesting minimum levels of post-consumer recycled content in all plastic beverage bottles and plastic bottles. I don't think we should look at just beverages. Why not look at shampoo bottles, dish soap bottles, detergent bottles? I don't think we should be focusing just on beverages. I think we need to look at all plastic containers. And thank you for the comment about shampoo bars and things like that. But for a while, some products are still going, going to be sold in plastic bottles. So I think we need to look at, let's make them more responsible by mandating recycled content in them. Uh, leash lids on beverage bottles. The beverage industry isn't thrilled about that, but they're actually doing it in other countries. They do it on sports bottles, sports drinks already. So this, that's a mechanism for reducing a lot of plastic litter. This is a big thing. Packaging evolves so much, food packaging in particular. I mean, 10 years ago, I think the food pouches that stand up on, you know, by themselves that have the wide gusset at the bottom, those didn't exist that long ago. Food was sold without those pouches. Um, packaging is evolving, but without consideration for what's recyclable or compostable. So I would like to say if the package is not recyclable or it's not compostable based on LA Sanitation's research, you shouldn't be able to sell that package in Los Angeles because it is a single use item that's going to go in the landfill. So I think I would like to see us basically force the market to reconsider packaging design. So it's not in one way, it's no longer a linear system. Um, meal kits, um, those have prolifer proliferated wildly during COVID. They were becoming extremely popular before, but a lot of the contents in there are non-recyclable again, gel packs. Um, part of this is the concept of extended producer responsibility. I'm saying if you put something out there in the marketplace, something that cannot go into any, cannot be recycled or composted, you need to fund a take back program for it. Much in the way we pay for advanced disposal fees on mattresses, motor oil, I think we should have those types of fees apply to things like the gel packs that you get with your, your meal kits. Now, the reason I'm focusing on textiles 
plastic, virtually all plastics are derived from fossil fuels. And synthetic fabrics are plastics. And what we're finding is we have a very robust fashion industry here in Los Angeles, but we know that a lot of manufacturers, um, shops, shops that cut patterns and things like that dispose of textile scraps. Um, they dispose of clothing if they have, if they've overstocked and things. We also know that unfortunately, online purchasing has skyrocketed again. Unfortunately, it's so cheap, relatively cheap for retailers, wholesalers, and fulfillment companies. If you send something back to them because it's the wrong size, chances are it's going to get thrown away. It's more expensive for them to open the box, inspect the item, repair the item, relabel or retag the item. It's cheaper to throw it away, and that's what's happening. And it's not just even textiles. It's all sorts of products, including electronics. I just think it's egregiously wasteful. It's an abuse of the system. Um, we have a lot of people in need. So I would like to see us set up mandatory take back programs for things of that sort. And I think these companies could partner with nonprofits that can mm. use these products. Um, we have a whole array of other policies under consideration. A lot of these are going to be contingent on doing CEQA analyses, obviously. Um, the first one is bioplastics. I personally am opposed to bioplastics. Those are plastics derived from plant material like cornstarch based plastics, plastics made out of sugarcane and so on. Um, the reason being, no, the, most of those are labeled as though they're compostable, but we don't know of any composting facilities that actually want them. Those things do not break down as quickly as other truly organic materials like grass clippings or food waste. So the composters may take these materials, but they throw them away. So in my mind, those are single use disposable items. We don't need them. And they're also contaminants. Um, recyclers don't want those mixed in with plastic products made from conventional plastics. They're considered contaminants. So I just don't, I think they're a bit of, of um, greenwashing personally. And I'm sorry, this, this um, point isn't, this slide isn't laid out quite right. Um, other suggestion was to ban PFAS, and luckily there was state legislation adopted, AB 1200 from Ting, that's going to do ban PFAS in food contact items. PFAS are so-called forever chemicals, they're suspected carcinogens, they're used in foodware because they are grease and moisture resistant, so if you've got a wrap around your hamburger, chances are that that paper is permeated with PFAS. And once again, we lived without those things, so I think we can live without them again. Um, clothes washers, with the abundance of synthetic clothing out there, synthetic clothing sheds microplastics when it's washed. Sewage treatment plants can capture some of the microplastics, but not all of them. So I'd like to see us add microfiltration systems into washing machines. And that was something that actually was proposed by Laura Friedman, state assembly person, but it was not passed, but I'm hoping she'll reintroduce it. Um, I'd also like to see a fee on synthetic items just to help um, fund possibly new equipment at sewage treatment plants. I would like to see labels, much improved labeling on products and packaging of all types. I think I as a consumer have the right, you know, when I buy a headset, I, I think I have the right to know what the constituent materials are. Is it metal? Is it plastic? And what are the rough ratios of those? Um, food packaging, sometimes I'm immersed in this sometimes, I can't tell what in the heck is a chip bag made out of. Is it mylar? Is it plastic? Is it plastic coated with something? I think consumers have a right to know exactly what they're buying. These, the policies listed on these slides will be a much heavier lift. We'll see if they survive sequel analysis, but this is, this is an idea we want to get out there. Um, these are things we think we can do in the short term. It's going to be implementing zero waste plans for city facilities and events, probably a citywide ban on polystyrene or EPS foodware, and then maybe six months to a year, lift all the exemptions from the current single use bag ban so that we're banning a wider, um, basically all plastic bags that are out there. So that's, that's what we're hopeful we can do in the next six months. Um, so next steps for all of these, we are coordinating with city attorney, a CEQA analysis will begin. Um, 
We're seeking funding because we'll have to do a lot of outreach. We'll have to consult with business groups. Obviously, they're going to be financial and operational impacts to small businesses, to restaurants. So we need to get their feedback. Um, how can we help them transition away from polystyrene foodware is going to be one of our major concerns. I'm thinking if we can assist with cooperative purchasing, that might be a way to get the prices down for the small moms, you know, mom and pop stores, because there is a price, usually there's going to be a bit of a price difference, price increase. The thing about polystyrene, the reason restaurants like it, it's super cheap, it retains heat and it doesn't leak. So alternatives are more costly, but we're, we think they're worth it in the long run. Um, I will pause there and just briefly say, Alex can get more into this, but I'm sure you're all familiar with SB 1383. This is probably one of the most challenging pieces of legislation that I have ever seen. Um, their underline are the, the goals, reduce organic disposal by 75% by 2025. I mean, that's huge. That's a statewide goal, but everybody has to help. Businesses, municipalities, food organizations, um, grocery stores, everybody's got a role to play in this, but it's just extremely challenging. The, the state actually, I think, lacks about 250 processing facilities are needed to meet this goal because of all the materials that will no longer go to landfills that will be diverted from landfills. So what we're saying is let's reduce organic waste. Let's look again upstream to see how we can reduce organic waste so we don't have to send it for processing, um, particularly food waste. And the other, other half of this that's really important, um, the county is still studying this right now. A lot of edible food gets disposed, unfortunately. I think it's obscene. Um, we, we all know grocery stores do it. It's it's part of our supply chain, our logistics. It's relatively cheap again to dispose of things. So the county is having to figure out how much of edible food, food that was disposed in the landfills was actually edible. And we have to increase recovery of that by 20%. So this is a huge lift. Alex can talk to you about the contracts having to be put in place. You know, it's a whole new, who's going to process this, who's going to haul it. What kind of equipment do we give to residents? Um, SB 1333 is super challenging, but it's very necessary because organic material generates methane when it's disposed. So absolutely no way around this, <coughs> excuse me. So these are just some FAQs and I'm happy to share the document. Um, eventually we, all the residents at LA SAN services will be able to participate in the food waste program. You'll be able to put your food into your green bin and what's great about this, it's going to be all raw and cooked food. It's not gonna be just vegetative produce. Um, so that, that's huge. Just the fact that it'll be all types of food makes it much easier to divert this material. <coughs> These are some other questions pertaining to businesses that are serviced by our Recycler franchise. Um, there is a cost, if you are a business, there is a cost for the green bin service. Um, let's see, what else is important here? Food waste generators, such as grocery stores, under SB 1383, they have to participate in a food recovery program, which is fabulous. And because of our Recycla program, Alex was there when this was all developed. <coughs> Excuse me. Recycla is the franchise that service provides services to large multifamily and to all businesses in Los Angeles, and they provide trash, blue bin, and green bin services. All the haulers in the franchise program are required to support, as you can see the very last item there, food rescue. Some do it with cash, some do it with in-kind services. One hauler gave a refrigerated truck to a food rescue group. So this has been going great guns. Um, Los Angeles was the first city in the nation that implemented this food recovery mandate and it's, it's just been fabulous. Um, to me. This just shows you since 2018, when the franchise was launched through September of last year, over $5 million in cash and in kind has gone to food rescue and to material reuse programs. 44,000 tons of food, edible food has been rescued. And if you use the metric of 1.2 pounds per meal, that's over 37,000 meals were rescued. 
So it, it's huge. When you consider what LA's homeless population is, it, it makes a significant difference. The last two columns, the haulers often also have to support reuse. And that can be things such as funding outreach from like Salvation Army or assisting with reuse programs, things of that sort, because we really want to encourage reuse, get people out of the mindset of throwing things away. But I think, I think the city and sanitation in particular should be really proud for requiring food recovery to be supported. And the, I think the results speak for themselves. Um, sanitation did have a pilot program with 18,000 homes that were able to recycle their food waste. And many of these received commercial grade incinerators or garbage disposals, because we're testing out what are the best options for people to manage their food waste at home. Um, and as Alex mentioned, a report on what we're planned to do with organics is going to council next month. Um, we do believe it will be providing pails to homes that want pails, so to make it easier for them to collect their food waste before they go empty those pails into the curbside green bins. But this is huge. Um, you know, we only took grass clippings and things like that sort, that type in our green bins. So moving to food waste, is, it's a whole new arena, a whole new world out there. Um, briefly on curbside recycling, as you probably know, um, LA started out with a source separated program many years ago. Many of you might remember the curbside bins, cans and bottles went one container, newsprint went in another. Then we switched to a commingle program where all recyclables went into one bin. LA had one of the most expansive blue bin programs or recycling programs in the country because we took all plastics, number one through seven. Unfortunately, um, LA and the world relied heavily upon China to take everything that we could throw at them. And just a couple of years ago, China said, there's too much contamination, we're getting trash shipped to us. Um, they were subjecting the high grade materials would be pulled out in the big cities by the recycling companies there and the lower grade plastics would be sent out in the countryside where you literally have people melting plastics over open flames. And so China said enough. So we are going to be changing our blue bin program to reflect realities on the ground, which is that for a while, somebody would take all those plastics, but that is not the case anymore. So we can't keep acting as though all plastics are recyclable. So we're going to be taking only plastics, number one, which is like your soda bottles, number two, which is like your gallon water jugs, and number five, some usually like yogurt containers. That will roll out this year. We'll be sending out new, um, we'll be getting new bins, bin labels out to the public. I don't know the exact kickoff date. That's probably a question for Alex, but the program is going to change significantly. Um, so I hope what that will do is force people to be more careful shoppers and consumers and consider the recyclability of not just the products that they're purchasing, but also the packaging for those products. And so zero waste, just to sum up, it's Curbside recycling was such a momentous change for California, but that's been 30 some years, right? But I think we all got so fixated on the bins as the method for handling everything. Now we have to change, go in the opposite direction. We have to think before the bin, think about what we can do when we buy things, when we order things. Um, it's about avoiding waste in the first place and reducing waste when you do, we all generate some waste, but we really need to look at methods for reducing our waste. Um, Andy had a great list for you there. My big takeaways, avoid single use disposable items. I mean, when you think about all the energy and materials embedded in like a disposable soda cup or straw, then you're gonna to toss it. Try to go for durable items, um, practice reuse, share items, really buy what you need versus what you want. Again, look at packaging. Packaging is a major constituent of what is in California landfills. So we've got to do what we can to reduce packaging. I, I be honest, this is something that I tried to do. I tried to eat, trying to eat more healthy, buying more fresh produce, but then I realized I'm not getting to it. I don't like to cook. So I said, I'm gonna stop doing that. I compost the food but I shouldn't be buying it in the first place if I'm not going to consume all of it. So I'm buying differently now. I buy more frozen things. There is a trade-off, of course, some of those come in plastic packaging, but I'm thinking the plastic packaging in that case is less harmful than throwing away perfectly good food. So take a look at what you're actually throwing away and adjust your habits accordingly. And I just have to accept the fact I'm not going to cook. 
<laughs> and then adjust my purchasing habits <laughs> accordingly. Um, no wish cycling, you know, please recycle just according to what's actually listed on the bin. People do wish cycle, oh, it's plastic. Yeah, I can toss it in the bin. That is not the case. We've got to be much more careful going forward. And I would just say this year, I would really focus on organics and food waste. Um, we have to cut down on the amount of organic materials that we landfill. So I would say really wrap up your focus on, on food. And what you can do to help obviously share this information, tell manufacturers and retailers, you know, what you think about their products and packaging. I stopped buying from Amazon several years ago because everything I got was over packaged. There would be boxes inside of boxes inside of buckets, boxes and plastic air pillows with heavy things like books that did not require any cushioning of that sort. So I wrote some not too nice letters to Amazon and I ceased buying from them. So that in a nutshell is um, what we're looking at and please welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, Alex. I see what you oh, mean. Oh, my, my pleasure. It was really, really well done. And um, I learned so much. And I'm sure a lot of people have questions. So go ahead. If you do have a question for our guests, go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, and, and while we collect those, Kathy, I think uh, we started out with a few questions. So Kathy, do you want to pose those to our guests? I, I think, wow, Jennifer, I think you've covered 90% of it. Um, one, one question. Um, that we had is what, what is the timeline? Do you know pretty close to when the organic food waste into the green bin will start? Because there's a lot of mixed messaging. <laughs> there's a lot of mixed messaging in the media. Oh. Now, the LA Times yeah. printed an article that said January 1st. Yes. So what, what is the truth? <laughs> <laughs> The, the regulation kicks in on January 2022. 20, the enforcement does not begin till 2024. Right. What we have for tier one, which are the large uh, producers of organics, they do, uh, they fall under the Recycla. They are part of the Recycla program and they can go ahead and participate in the program. So they just have to call the Recycla service provider and they can get the bin for them to begin uh, organics if they are not already. I mean, we know a lot of places like Ralph and others already have a program in place. So for those who are not, they can go ahead. On the residential side, um, we started ahead, but with COVID, we basically got a, we kind of kind of got stuck. We did the 18,000 homes. Some of them are in the valley and throughout the city, actually, the 18,000 homes. And it was a successful program, but we could not proceed because of the COVID and then we needed funding from council. Um, these programs are not cheap. And so we put a request for the proposals. We got proposals back. And, you know, I can share with you, um, we, are, we got about eight companies who have submitted and the prices range from about $80 a ton to process the organic waste up to $279 per ton. In basically, just to put it in perspective, we're paying right now about $45 a ton for organics. We, we estimate we're gonna be generating about 2,800 tons a day. Right now we are generating 1,776. We believe another thousand tons could be recovered from the black bin. So when you start doing the math and the calculations, we're looking at a subsidy from the general fund to the tune about maybe 60 to $80 million. Um, and the reason for that is not a single company is able to handle all the material. Um, so we'll have to go with two or three companies. We'll have to have a backup. And the kitchen pails cost us about between four to $6 to give that. And we decided, well, it's ironic. It's made of plastic, right? And we have a whole policy on plastic. So we're going to make it on, on the request. If, it, if a customer wants to have that kitchen pail for the residential, they can just call us. We'll give them the pail. They can come to an open house event, pick up the kitchen pail, get the public education, get the education also how to use it, how to clean it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this way keep this process going. 
So the first step really is to go to council next month, get the council support to launch the program sometime in late spring or early summer throughout and begin the process expanding it from the 18,000 homes we have right now in the program to the 750,000. Are we in compliance with the state? Yes, we are. Um, because we will be, have the program well ahead of 2024. We will be implementing it this year. Should we have done it earlier? You know, we, that's really our intention was before even SB 1383, we started working on the zero waste, but anything, you know, comes with money. And we are 100% up to this point where supported by the special fund, which is the money you pay us every month on your um, DWP bill, the 3632. That's how we really survive. But for us to add the organics in, we're really looking about seven to $10 per household. And you know that's steep price. So we need to, there is, you know, we got the city got some money. I mean, you know, from the federal government, right? as part of the Biden administration help of the city. And so we we want council to give us the green light to use some general fund money to expand the program. I think probably mm -hmm. I gave you everything you were asking for and, I, but you know, yeah. sorry. It's, it's hard, it's, it's, you know, what to do in the meantime, I guess, is just do what we've been doing, which is uh, lawn, lawn and garden waste. Well, yeah, great. Yes, please continue with that one. If people want to have a compost at home, we had workshops where people could come in and learn how to compost in their backyard. But that doesn't really go up to the high temperature like the professional one for some of the material. Mm -hmm. But we are restarting those because we suspended them because of COVID. But then we get the Omicron and people getting sick. Mm -hmm. So we're waiting hopefully till after this Omicron is behind us, maybe when the curve tends down, to open the workshop. We also look, go on, we're planning to go to the board probably sometime in March with, uh, we are doing partnership with LA Compost. We got a grant from the federal government and we have some money from the American Rescue Act to establish 25 locations around the city where residents could bring in farmer's market and uh, compost hub drop off. So if you're going to farmer's market to pick up your fresh produce, you can drop your organics at that location. So we are looking and we'll have two to three compost hubs where people could bring in their food, you know, just like they do in New York. You know, they, they can bring them to farmer's market, they bring them to compost hubs and they could be process them until we can come. In the meantime, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing and, um, and hopefully, once council approves it, we'll launch it later this spring, the program. Okay. Well, let's let's get to some of the questions uh, in our well, chat. I pulled some questions out. There are a ton of really good questions. I hope we have time to get through these. So from uh, Christy asked, can we put those hot food takeout cardboard food boxes in the green bin for composting with food or can they be recycled? You know, those kind of those boxes that fold over and you, you get takeout in them. Unless I see them, I we are not putting them in the green bin right now because we've done few tests on the products with recology and they fail to decompose. Uh, they go up to, we spend about 120 days in to 145 days and then we ask them to push it to about 160 days. And still a lot of these products did not decompose. On the recycling, we have new stickers. Unfortunately, our vendor has in, having pro uh, machine problems to put the new stickers on. So we're still sticking the old labels by hand. They're supposed to be hot stamped. So once we can get that, we are implementing the new stickers. The new stickers, all it does, drop in the, pro uh, the plastics three, four, six, and seven out and clarify the other stuff goes in. So if it has food, no, we don't want it in the blue bin. Hopefully if we can find uh, products that are compostable, we will add them to the, to the green bin. 
I actually I was surprised I was telling Jennifer that McDonald's in some locations are testing now wooden spoons oh, right, yeah. and right. wooden knives with their, you know, when you go in and get your uh, big breakfast. Right. So. Maybe, maybe we need bamboo cutlery instead of <laughs> so yeah. we're not yeah. down trees, right? Right, um, right. So uh, Kim asked, can we put the Trader Joe's green produce bags in the green bins? Um, I was curious, in one of your slides, Jennifer, you mentioned, and in fact, you had a picture of the cucumbers. That right. was one kind of plastic wrap. But now Trader Joe's has these, you, you probably know them, the thin bags you put your produce in, and they say recyclable, they say compost, uh, co uh, compostable. Are they, um, can we, can we, uh, Put those in in a green bin i think the short answer is we'll have, have to once the food waste contracts are in place we'll have to have those vendors test things right alex to see what is compatible with their processes the plastic it doesn't work whether it's um green it's white it's all the same it jams the machines uh -huh. so they're not really being recycled mm -hmm. um so on is it compostable we have not, the one we saw at Ecology in San Francisco, they accept them, as Jennifer was saying, they do accept them as part of their composting operation, but then they pull them out as trash at the back end and they send them to the landfill. Mm -hmm. So unless we could test these products, and we tested several with Ecology, and none of them, the one we tested, decompose. And so, uh, yeah, I, right now we do not, they're considered trash. Okay. Um, from Stephen Mack, he said, I generate lots of printed paper waste. I've been putting it in the blue bin. Should I start shredding the paper so that it can be composted? No, okay. keep them in a blue bin. They get higher value. In the, we still get some money, Stephen, in the, from the recyclables now. The markets are recovering, especially mm -hmm. in North America. There is, so we would like them in the blue bin so we can recycle them. Okay. Should it be shredded first? I think that's what he's asking. If it it's white paper, no. It's more valuable unshredded. If it has special information on it or certain right. stuff, yeah. yeah, you can shred them and put them in one bag, and then they we can they can pull them out. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, from Cheryl, I'm a retired costumer, uh, and because you mentioned the uh, fabric uh, uh, remnants. Um, she said, I'm aware of the amount of waste in the wardrobe section of the entertainment industry. Is there any plan to work with the studios on fabric and fiber issues? Mm. Well, we're getting a, I think we've got some grant funding to look at textile scraps, but I believe they're going to be working primarily with the cutters, you know, um, in downtown LA. I, I don't know about the studios, haven't heard about that. Alex, do you know? Yeah, the pilot we're doing is with the garment industry and with LA fashion uh -huh. downtown. Okay. So, but this is a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Joanne was curious, what will happen to the composted food once it reaches the facilities? Uh, okay, when it reaches the compost facilities. Uh -huh. So the, basically it's mixed with the green material and some other products and they usually depends on the facility go, well, there's several facilities. So let's say it's a standard compost operation. It goes between 120 days, 140 days. And then that product we take back or we wanna make sure it's available for our residents because under SB 1383, we have a procurement element. So we have to take some compost back. Right now, if we do it ourselves, we provide the mulch and uh, to our residents free of charge. Mm -hmm. So we want to give some of this back and some of it goes to the farmers who use it on their land. If the food waste is, uh, and that's, there's another operation going on in the Valley, the waste management facility, is that they take the food waste, they press it. It's like a garlic press. They squeeze the liquid out. That material is sent to Energia facility in Rialto. It's an anaerobic digestion facility and um, they can process it. Actually, though, that's one of the vendors who proposed. So the rest of the material is taken, cleaned up. Some of it is composted. Some of it is just um, landfilled if it's dirty. So we are working with Cal Recycle, Waste Management 
Rialto and the local enforcement agency to see the calculations on that one because under SB 1383, you have to have a high organic diversion facility to be able to, to be considered processing the material. But it's one of the proposals actually for uh, that we are considering. We are also looking at having um, some kind of facility built in LA in addition to that one. Mm -hmm. So it depends if the food go waste go to compost, one option, if it goes to these facilities is different. And we did the pilot program, I know Jennifer mentioned, where we asked yeah. residents who were close proximity to Hyperion about 450. We gave yeah. them high power syncreators a couple of years ago. And, you know, it's like we trust, but we want to also know if they really do want it. We spent a lot of money on the project. We had about 120 people and we were watching the black, the green bin that they have to see if the food waste what we found out that a lot of people were not using the syncreator, with very few people using it. But what's so interesting was the amount of food people were purchasing went down. So they were getting the public education about shop wise, you know, recycle the rest, you know, don't waste food. So they took that element, although they did not put it down the sink, so we can harness the energy from a Hyperion from mm -hmm. it. But it was kind of interesting study that we're going to be hopefully publishing a paper on soon. Interesting. I'm talking to some people about um, um, feeding uh, insects and then uh, using those as animal food. Wondering if, uh, about the prospects of taking food waste and then uh, stabilizing them through drying or freezing and then making those available for insect uh, food. Yeah, there's a there's a cricket farm. There, there was a cricket farm near LAX, and then I think there was a somebody else out in the Holly, North Hollywood doing that. I don't know what kind of food they procure, though. Do you know what they feed them currently? Well, there's there's different insects. You know, the the crickets, uh, black soldier fly, uh, oh, galaria, right, right. and and a number of different ones. So there's different you know things, but but um, it seems like. It would be easy to supplement um, uh, various insect diets, you know, with right. various uh, food food scrap. We call it now versus waste. <laughs> right. There is a facility. I think it was a European company building one out by Harupa that I think was supposed to be a black soldier fly facility. I haven't read anything about it though for literally two years. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll mark it down. Something to look into. Jennifer, you want to talk about the facility you visited in the last six months? Oh, oh the, the aerobic facility? Yeah. The, well, I went two places. Greek Theater, and I put this in the chat, has an echo vim. It's a small um, piece of, a, you know, steel equipment. Looks like a re refrigerator, freezer. Dehydrates all types of food waste. There, you can put some paper in there. The output looks like coffee grounds, and then they use it as a um, soil supplement at the Greek Theater again. Then there's another company, there's a company called, I think, Real, R-E-E-L Magic, that deals primarily with the studios and the film industry. And they have this, it's called Nova is a brand, N-O-V-A, and I believe it's a Dutch company. It's an aerobic digester, it's small scale, so it uses its air. It's not anaerobic, it's aerobic. And again, about the size of a commercial freezer compartment, and it can take some paper waste, and they're using it at the, there's a sound stage down in the South Basin place, and it's also portable. They have the have them on trailers, so it would be a good thing for um, events also. And the output, again, looks like coffee grounds. I was in the room where one of the one of the machines was operating. There was no odor at all, so there, there's some small-scale technology that, you know, large businesses possibly restaurants or groups of restaurants could invest in. You know, if you have a food court in a mall, might be appropriate for something like that. Alex, I had a question from Shelley about SB 1383 and multifamily buildings. Is, do they need to be, do the multifamily buildings need to be compliant? Um, so there's some confusion about that. And also how, how do you enforce a group <laughs> a group effort when, when you have residents that are on it and residents that don't really care. How, how complicated does that get? 
You know, enforcement is part of SB 1383, and that begins in 2024. For multifamily, the short answer, yes, they need to be part of the program. The landlord need to contact their recycler service provider and ask for those bins. Also, in under recycler, we put uh, requirements on the recycler service provider to reduce the amount of tonnage going to the landfill by one million tons. So, if they do, if they fail to achieve the one million ton by 2025, there is liquidated damages on the recycler service providers because. And this is the strategy we did before SB 1383. We knew SB 1383 was being considered, discussed, but we did not have the regulations out yet. So our, our train of thought was kind of slightly different, is instead of forcing, trying to go after 1.2 million people who live in multifamily units and in businesses, we thought if we can get the providers to be the agent to go out, come up with the programs and give incentives for the apartment owners to be part of the program. That is a better way. And so when they signed the agreement, we told them what the targets are. How would you achieve it? So every one of the recycler service providers or the haulers, they came up with their plan. They said, we can reach the 1 million diversion if I do this much recycling, this how much food rescue, this is how much organics I will do. So we did not prescribe to them what they need to do. They came to us, we took as they gave it to us and we plugged it in their contracts. And the thing is we wanted them to work with the apartment owners. And I wanna be open. I always been, I like to always be open and tell you exactly what we are struggling in the city of Los Angeles right now between the restaurants. If you've been to Chinatown, I was about a couple of months ago driving through it. I worked downtown a few days a week and the 50% of the restaurants are shut down. So to go in with another fee increase on the restaurants, that's very hard for council members to do when the business are struggling. So that's why we need the incentive of the recycler service providers. They, you know, And we gave them money as part of the recycler contracts to build the infrastructure for those organics. So that's the incentive we, prov we provided, the recycler service providers. So th also the apartment buildings owners, they came to us and they said, well, I have rent stabilization ordinance on me. I cannot increase the rent. You, the city or you guys, like they tell us, put this, you cannot raise the rent or evict people till 2023. That's when it's this one. So. So that's how we've been lenient now for, you know, so it's really by apartments choosing on their own to be part of the program right now. By, by 2024, we, the city, are obligated under 2023 to send our inspectors out and check the building. And if you not recycling, and again, this is an SB 1383 regulations, we have to give them a, we can probably give them first warning, second warning, but after that, we have to place a fine. And so that's where the creativity will have to come. And maybe we have to do something like Korea does, yeah, right? And you've seen uh, they come in with their batch, they scan it, they put their organics in so you know who's putting what. But we do need to <laughs> implement the enforcement starting 2024. Alex, can I just ask really, sorry to interrupt, but can I ask really quickly on this? So I'm, I'm picking up that for multifamily buildings, we should reach out to our recycler provider, see where they are in the chain, how long it's going to take them to get to our building, and also ask them to provide, and this is the important piece to, mount, to my mind, to provide us with their educational materials so that those of us who live in multifamily can begin to share those educational materials with the other residents in the building. Because if the green bins just show up, it's not gonna be very successful. Um, people are gonna to wanna to know how often is it gonna get collected? What can they and can they not put in? So I'm, I, I hear you saying that the Recycla vendors are the ones responsible for providing all the education on these new rules on recycling and on compostables. 
So I'm asking if this is the right course of action to take to reach out to, in my case, waste management, ask them where we are in the queue and ask them to provide their educational materials that they themselves have developed. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I will add just one prior step to that is that ask them for a waste assessment. So they're supposed to come in, look at your bins and say, okay, I have, you have this amount of organics that need to go from the black bin into the green bin. And if, there, if they are willing to take the shredded paper that was asked before, we want to put, want you to put over here, the pizza box that is greased with cheese, put them over here. So they're supposed to give you that information. So they do a free waste assessment. It's not going to cost you anything, even if you decide not to go with them. So they tell you the or to, do, to go with the program at this stage. So they do the free waste assessment. They tell you the amount of green bin. And also that is an opportunity to reduce the amount of black bin. So you could reduce, well, you know you're gonna have to pay more for the green. Now you have to pay less for the black and maybe increase also the blue bin. Right. So this way it balances it out. So ask all the questions perfect. The first step, have them do a waste assessment. Thanks. And I, it'd be really, I know that neighborhood councils would like to, many neighborhood councils would like to be helpful um, in terms of educating, you know, folks in the community, be they single family or multifamily, on what's coming and what steps to take. So that's where I think it would be helpful if the city can find resources to, uh, you know, help develop some materials so that we can help prep residents so that when 2024 comes, we won't be out of compliance. No, yeah, and I think honestly, I don't believe we'll be out of compliance. I think we'll be in compliance because at the back end, the council has, and mayor told us, they wanna reach 90% diversion by 2025. So we have a higher rate than SB 1383. It's really coming back to the funding. And in February, if the council gives us the green light to proceed, we then reach out to the neighborhood council. The questions I have been getting from several neighborhood councils, how much money are you guys gonna char charge me? Oh, I wanna know how, you know, we understand you guys haven't had the rate increase since 2008, but every time you wanna put your hand in my pocket, so to speak, <laughs> I wanna know how much you're pulling out or how much you want me to pay. So the report will be going to council and we giving the council how much we think is this program is gonna cost to implement. And then council will decide whether they want the residents to share some of the cost and they pick up the, the cost or no, we're gonna pick up the cost for the first couple of years implementation. Then we can do Prop 218, go to the go to the neighborhood council and ask them for it. But once we can get the green light, the green light in February, then we can uh, do more uh, reach out to neighborhood council, but we've been engaged with several of them. And the cost, you know, the questions, and you, all of you probably, you know, I live by myself, they, you know, I don't generate that much. Why should I pay this much as my neighbor who's generating more of this trash? You know, so all these questions we have to be able to answer to. Thanks. I just, I think people just really want good guidance and to know right. what they're supposed to be doing. Um, oh, I have a maybe. couple of uh, couple of questions I'm gonna combine here. Um, I'm looking at the time. This is just so great. And there's so many great questions. So you guys, Alex and Jennifer, feel free to, you know, pick through if um, I have some on my list, I'm still getting to. So one is a specific and then a general. So um, uh, takeout cups, um, should they be landfilled or can they be recycled or composited? And then adding to that, the broader thing is what are our compost options for 2022 to 24? So first, just about the cup, is that landfill, is that recycled, composted for the uh, takeout cups, and then our compost options for 22 to 24. Well, the takeout cups, I've seen the all plastic type, those will go in the landfill because they're probably a number six plastic. If it's number one, two, or five, we'll take it, but they're probably number six. And the paper soda cups, currently those have, those are trash. Um, like the coffee cups, for example, the coffee cups, you would get the paper coffee cups. Yeah. Currently those are trash. We cool. don't take food contaminated paper in the blue bin. Uh-huh. 
Okay. And currently you cannot put food soil paper in the green bin. Eventually you will be able to, but not now. Okay. And then the, the question about the, uh, our compost options for 22 to 24. Is it if we start in the summer, I mean, we, eventually by 2023, compost will be available at your home. In the meantime, we will we'll have drop off locations throughout the city where you can take the material for, to be composted and you can pick up a compost bag from the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. So LA Compost will be collecting it when they're giving you a compost you can take with you home. Okay. There was a question about DWP. I think Stephen, are any of the recycled compost material burned by LAWP? No, we're not, banning, we're not burning anything with DWP. Um, that's not being considered those facilities are very expensive and, um, but there is a motion for us to report back on that one. We have not uh, addressed that motion back. Okay. Uh, one question earlier on from uh, Miles, um, and, and I've heard this come up before. Uh, it's about, you know, there are a lot of bans on businesses and responsibility on, compute, on computers, on consumers to be smart. Uh, and he asked, what about flipping it around uh, and creating tax incentives uh, for, for uh, companies, uh, partnering with the uh, biggest consumers like LA City, UCLA, et cetera, uh, to buy and consume along with your guidelines, um, instead of no, figuring out how to do the yes to encourage oh. them to make uh, moves in that direction. Wow, that, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I, I I think that falls into environmentally preferable purchasing. Um, we're working on, on that at the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need to tighten up your specifications to make sure you buy the most environmentally friendly products you can. Um, huh, are you thinking like a guide of what to buy or well, cooperative I, purchasing? I think more the approach of of uh, creating incentives, you know, giving them a reason oh. why they should either, you, oh. know, you know, produce differently or package differently or oh. you know, um, encourage yeah. them in the direction that we all want them to go. So the, the carrot stick dilemma. Yeah, um. <laughs> exactly. I mean, right yeah, now, if you buy if you buy electronics, and I think Jennifer touched on in her presentation, yeah. if you buy an electronic, there is a fee that comes with it for the end of life. Mm -hmm. If you bought a mattress, there is fifteen dollars that comes in. So that at the end, when you when the city takes it or the processor take it, they, everybody gets some money. We get about four to six dollars per you know per mattress. The rest go. Some of it goes to the state. Some of it goes to the manufacturer. So mm -hmm. there is the only thing is the consumer pays for it. I mean, I bought for my boys, yeah. two of them, and we end up paying thirty dollars. So yeah, we can put in the fee. The consumer is gonna pay it, but I think that's more uh, transparent. And mm -hmm. we did mention that in our report actually mm -hmm. about having a fee on on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see Andy put in the chat that UCLA does in fact have a program, so they are starting starting to do that. Um, uh, Kathy, do you have any, uh, I'm just looking at the time, so we're going to probably just, just uh, have a time for a few more questions. And then I, have, I, I actually have one last quick question that can mm -hmm. kind of maybe tie this up from Sam, who would like to know, um, what kind of metric um, would you use for success at the end of 2024 going into 2025? And I might add, uh, you know, what kind of annual metrics should we hope to see over the next four years? Two, three, Great four. question. We mm -hmm. have 2.5 million tons a, a year from between the residential program, where we have close to about a million, and then we have about 1.6 million from the commercial. Our goal is by 2025, have 1 million tons out of the landfill from the commercial, where there's about a couple hundred thousand tons coming from the residential. So that's uh, what we're pulling out, because if we can pull out about 1.2 million tons from the landfill, that's less greenhouse gas being, less methane going up, less greenhouse gas impact. That's the first metrics we are looking into. Through the recycler contracts, there is a table in each of the recycler service providers, and every year they measure, they have what they need to reduction need to achieve. The first 
uh, evaluation happened this year. So for the entire 2022, we'll be calculating what they're doing, what the diversion is. And by 2023, if they fail, there is liquidated damages in their contracts that they will have to pay for failure to reach the diversion rates. That's great. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. And um, if anybody feels like that they have some lingering questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And if it's okay, Alex, Jennifer, would it be okay if we pose some follow-up questions that uh, people... Yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. No. Keep, keep Absolutely. the conversation going. So uh, just thank you so much, both of you. Uh, this has thank been you. a great way to kick off the year. Thank and you time. so much for your time thank and you. effort. Yes, thank you. Right. Have a good night. Good. So great. Well, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. It was a great meeting tonight. Again, uh, we'll try to uh, advance your questions if there was anything left over. Um, but we definitely have a relationship with these folks and we'll share the slides. So that might uh, um, be more to digest. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing you next uh, next month.